morning. Welcome to the second day of reading Gary Vasquez's three responses to an archival discovery. Our first speaker this morning is Ian Moore. A special student work of Martin Heidegger, Ian Moore is a faculty member at St. John's College in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and associate editor of the journal Philosophy Today, where it's worth mentioning the proceedings of this conference will be published. Uh, Ian is co-editor of a volume of writing by Jean Vaughan, titled Transcendence and the Concrete. He's also the author of numerous essays on Heidegger, Wall, Eckhart, among other topics. Ian has also translated work from both French and German, an impressive number of works uh, by Hamacher, Nancy, Heidegger, Koja, Fichte, as well as Peter Chavny's book, Freedom to Fail, Heidegger's Anarchy. The title of Ian's talk today, as you see, is The Placement of Detachment. Please welcome Ian Moore. Thank you, Katie. Uh, and thanks to everybody who made this conference possible. I'm very honored to be here. What does it mean to place a word of which the thing tends to resist all place? What, moreover, does it mean to restrict the meaning of a word of which the thing and the word tends to thwart all restriction. I am asking here not just about how to contain polysemy, about how to shelter it from dispersion and dissemination, about how to prevent one of the valences of a word from detaching itself and taking on a life of its own. I am also, and in particular, asking about how to delimit a word such as detachment. In his essay, Die Sprache im Gedicht, Heidegger identifies this term, or rather its German counterparts, Abgeschiedenheit, as the point at which Trockel's entire body of poetic work is gathered together. Indeed, Heidegger defines detachment itself as a sort of gathering, as though there were nothing oxymoronic about a detached gathering, or a detachment that gathers, as though there were nothing in need of further explanation or justification. Far from needing to detach ourselves from space, time, and language, as one might expect from the word and its history, Heidegger instead exhorts us to attach ourselves to the specific spatial, temporal, and linguistic senses he ascribes to detachment. Nearly every key term in his essay is subjected to etymological scrutiny, Ort, Fremd, Geschlecht, Wahnsinn, Geist, etc. About the origins of detachment, however, Heidegger remains silent. What is he avoiding? What is haunting him? Derrida's work on Heidegger, especially his recently published seminar sessions on Geschlecht from the Fantôme de l'Ofre, is, among other things, a work of exorcism. An exercise in not exactly driving away Heidegger's ghosts, but in driving them out into the open for investigation, no matter how ghastly they may be. Derrida, along with many others in this room today, has summoned many such specters, and not just those haunting Heidegger's reading of Trockel. The latter include, to name but a few, and we've been hearing about these during this conference so far. Sexual difference, animality, the idiom, Christianity, Geist, and even the ghostly sense of Geist itself. One term, however, which Derrida does not as such deconstruct, but which preoccupies him in his marginalia to an interpretation of Heidegger, um, is detachment, uh, especially as it is connected to the problem of gathering. And so we can see this in Derrida's marginalia to the German and uh, French translation of Heidegger's essay, Als Versammlung hat die Abgeschiedenheit das Wesen des Ortes, and then you can see the French up there. Um, so, so there Heidegger is explicitly connecting gathering and attachments. In this paper, I will make use of Derrida's way of reading other important terms in Heidegger's essay, and of the little he has to say about detachment in order to argue that detachment is one of the most problematic, most deconstructible concepts in Heidegger's text. And yet it is not, for all of that, an exclusively problematic concept. Rather, when loosed from the strictures, perhaps the, perhaps the noose that Heidegger puts on it, detachment may, may be a useful way to think about the very work and love of deconstruction. So section one, the problem of polysemy. Derrida points out that Heidegger sees only two options when it comes to polysemy. Either it is gathered together into a unique point of unification, or it succumbs to lax and sloppy imprecision, tertium non dator. Now, if the polysemy of poetic speech is to be properly poetic, surely it can't be a product of slapdash wordplay. 
If it were, poetry would hardly merit its equal status with thought on Heidegger's account. The polysemy of poetic speech must therefore spring from a single source, or to use Heidegger's metaphor, poetic polyphony must resound from a tonic, a grundton. There can be dissonance, perhaps even modulation, but the music of poetry will always be rooted in the home key. Poetry, at least any poetry deserving of the name, is never atonal. Nor is thought. Rather, all thinking for Heidegger, if it is to be authentic, must gather in language what being has already gathered indeed. On this view, Derrida writes, and we heard uh, this quote yesterday, uh, there can be no uh, rigorous thought or poetic writing of dissemination. We might have to resort to old German, but no meaning as such will escape us. Only the bad poet and the bad thinker will go essentially astray. Only they are condemned to wander without a home. Only they lack a destination. Heidegger, it must be admitted, also likes the language of detours, byways, and timber tracks. The role of these apparent digressions is nevertheless different. While they may seem useless, they actually help Heidegger along his way. Heidegger may have blundered about in the dark at times, but there was always, as he put it, one star guiding him, however faintly, however much it may have seemed like a foolish fire. A similar star guides Trockel's poetry. Indeed, if Derrida is right, that Heidegger's reading of Trockel is marked by Heidegger's own situation, his own signature, and the sense of his own path, then perhaps Heidegger sees it as the same star. At any rate, Heidegger takes great pains throughout his reading to situate Trockel's body of work properly, to put it in its proper place. This place is detachment. I will now turn to the circuitous course Heidegger <coughs> takes, or leads us on, to arrive at this place. One major question guiding my analysis will be whether detachment is in fact beholden to the binary of gathering or carelessness, or whether in this case a third isn't given after all. Section 2, Heidegger's placement of detachments. From its first word on, Heidegger's essay confronts us with the problem of translation. The subtitle tells us that Heidegger will be attempting an Erotorung of Trockel's Gedicht, a discussion, we might think, of Trockel's poem. But Heidegger declares from the outset that Erotun will instead mean to indicate, to guide toward the Ort, the place. To discuss is to situate or M place. And what is to be put in its proper place is not just a particular poem of Trockel, but everything that Trockel has gathered and condensed, gedichtet, into song. We thus have a gathering in place of what has already been gathered in language, a condensation of a condensation. Like the tip of a spear, which Heidegger explains Ort meant originally, the place is where everything in the Gedicht comes together, sharply and to the point. Heidegger asserts that there can be but one Gedicht from which the poet precipitates her song. Likewise, the place in and from which all of this occurs and the tone in which it resounds are singular. We could at this point begin questioning Heidegger's authoritative, even authoritarian tone here, his confidence in the singularity of the place of the poetry. I would, however, like to take a different approach and turn to Heidegger's development of the place of Trockel's Gedicht. The questions of singularity and gathering will not leave us, though. Rather, the singular place of gathering will be exposed and shaken by the very situation of Heidegger's reading. Where to begin? Which poem or line will provide the measure? In order to find the place of the poetry as a whole, we must elucidate certain poems. But in order to draw out the limpid light that shines through these poems, we must already have some sense for the place in which they are situated and from which such light comes. Emplacing and elucidating are therefore interdependent. Thus any selection will inevitably seem arbitrary at the outset. Nonetheless, Heidegger already has the place in view, however it was that he came to see it. Like the wandering of the stranger we are soon to learn about, Heidegger's discourse has a determinate and already determined destination. He knows in advance which poem will guide us there. Yet whatever the case may be for Heidegger's initial selection, the path we end up following uh, will not be leise, soft and quiet, nor will we glide along smoothly, Galicia, gleiten, which according to Heidegger's declaration is what leise means, or calls for, heis, in Trockel's Gedicht. Rather, our trajectory will be filled with leaps and bounds from one poem to the next, concatenated only by what Derrida identifies as a slippery metonymy whose explanations go unheard. It seems from Heidegger's perspective that the fastest way to the place of Trockel's poetry is to begin not with a poem, nor even with a line from a poem, but with a portion of a line from the poem Frühling der Seele. Trockel writes, Es ist die Seele ein fremdes auf Erden. 
The reader might hear this initially as the soul is something strange on or even to the earth. The soul belongs elf elsewhere. It is not at home here on the earth. Even in its body, the soul is more like a prisoner than a charioteer. As Trockel himself writes in a letter to Ludwig von Ficker, uh, and here I'm quoting David Krell's translation, um, quote, I long for the day when the soul in this soulless body of mine, plagued by melancholy, will no longer wish to dwell, will no longer be able to dwell. The day when my soul abandons this figure of mockery composed of filth and rots, which is an all too faithful mirror image of a godless and accursed century. But in Heidegger's eyes, the reader, and we might ask Trockel himself, would be mistaken. Having just begun, we must therefore immediately backtrack. Fremd, Heidegger says, does not actually or authentically mean alien, foreign, or strange. Quote, what we are not familiar with, what does not appeal to us, something that instead burdens and disquiets us. End quote. Fremd actually, and oddly still, means the same as the old High German, from. Quote, forward towards somewhere else, on the way to, on toward what is already held in store for one. It is not entirely clear how, nor, for instance, is it clear how Trockel would have had much time to study Old High German in his short and troubled lifespan. But Heidegger is not burdened or disquieted by such concerns. He knows what the word means, and we should too. But where does Heidegger himself get this etymology? Is he simply drawing on a lexicon? Or did he somehow derive it himself from a thorough study of the medieval canon? In any case, and the latter seems dubious to me, Without citing any examples from Old High German literature, he next assures the reader, declaratively and without hesitation, that the path is not one that the essentially foreign soul must first forge. Rather, the soul's path already lies out ahead of it. It therefore need not err aimlessly along the way. Wandering, properly understood, is not without a reason why. The way is not the goal. Only the Geschlecht of decaying and degenerate humans have no course to follow. The soul, in contrast, has left such people behind. It has died to their corruption. It has even separated itself from its loved ones who have become other to it. As Trockel writes in the last two stanzas of Herb Seele, I just read the German, you can see the English up here. Bald entbreitet Fisch und Wild, blaue Seele, dunkles Wandern, schied uns bald von lieben Andern, Abend wechselt Sinn und Bild. Recht in Lebens, Brot und Wein, Gott in deine milden Hände, legt der Mensch das dunkle Ende aller Schuld und roter Pein. One might hear in Trockel's words a call to leave this wicked, wayward world behind and to commend oneself to God. Heidegger, however, would have us believe the opposite. He deploys at least three strategies in his interpretation. First, he quotes selectively. For instance, he only ever cites from the penultimate, <coughs> less clearly religious stanza of Habstele without any regard for its place within the poem as a whole. And Derrida is very concerned about this in, in this reading. Um, indeed, contrary to the final stanza, he even says that the day's decline into evening is not an ending, but rather only an inclination to prepare the beginning of the soul's journey. It is thus less a, de a departure in the sense of death, which the German Abgeschiedenheit suggests, than a point of departure is something new. At least in this one respect, the English departure, along with Derrida's cognate rendering of Abgeschiedenheit as Depart, is superior to the German. It has the sense of departure as a point of departure. Abgeschiedenheit doesn't convey that. Uh, the second strategy is that Heidegger downplays or recasts the Christian elements, bread and wine, but also, less literally, spirit and resurrection. Just as Trockel's Gedicht has a univocal sense, so do Christianity, Platonism, metaphysics, and science, and not necessarily independently, for they are ultimately of a piece. Only in the case of the former, Trockel's Gedicht, Heidegger sees a good univocity, as Derrida puts it, whereas in that of the latter, Christiano, Platonico, metaphysical science, the univocity is bad. Third, Heidegger resorts to German etymology or reinterprets words according to a putatively more original sense. We have already seen this with Fremd. The soul is not moving away from the earth, it is on the way to the earth. It must moreover go under, but going under does not mean downfall or deterioration, or even anything catastrophic, as one might expect. It is the course the soul must follow, or rather rediscover, before the metaphysical interpretation of it had gone astray. This course leads to the tranquility of the dead, but Heidegger explains, again in tension with the last stanza of Habseele, death does not signal the ending of earthly life. Death is instead the very course of the stranger's going under. Provided we follow this stranger, 
we too will become strangers to the peace of Kashesh and find what is most properly and essentially our own. Heidegger's radical rereading continues. By going under, the soul comes to experience the earth not as a material counterpart to the soul, not as a realm of accident and corruption, but as a, quote, more serene homeland for the Geschlecht that is returning home, end quote. Here the soul does not eliminate or overcome difference, whether it be between the sexes, the tribes, the generations, or the species, and Geschlecht can mean all of these things, but twists the outcome of the discordant blow of difference into a softer and more tranquil mark of gentleness. Or rather, it twists the dissonant difference back into the gentleness of old, where the Geschlechter were not at war, where there was no dissension, but only the gathering of a more tender, more consonant double. Gentleness does zumpte, just as, in fact, this, quote, peaceful gathering according to the literal sense of the word, end quote, as Heidegger decrees in another attempt at clarification through etymologization. This gathering of gentleness is not without multiplicity, or better, duplicity, in both senses of the word. Gentleness is a gathering, or enfolding, of two folds. But there is something double-dealing about this. For we might ask, how did or does the peaceful gathering of gentleness end up striking us with the curse of dissension, shattering the double into conflicting singles? Why, as Heidegger indicates in a marginal note of his personal copy of Trottel, does Aufruhr, insurgency, upheaval, belong together not only with gentleness, but with Gelassenheit, releasement, as essential, even if opposed, components of Geist. So we've got Geist here, and he seems to be setting up a kind of opposition between Gelassenheit and Das, das Zampte on the one hand, releasement, gentleness, and Aufruhr, insurgency, on the other. How does it, how does it split out into this, these, these different senses, uh, is a question we could ask. Additionally, Heidegger sees the harmonious double as so tightly plied that he is compelled or beckoned to describe it oxymoronically, as a one-fold, two-fold, or in Latinate terms he would never allow as a simple duplicity. Derrida's translations as ampli sans pli and the sans pli du pli uh, nicely capture this tension. Heidegger's oxymoronic rendering may be a result of his desire to preempt dispersion, while at the same time avoiding aesthetic monism. Heidegger clearly thinks there has been, and there can be, uh, still, there still can be dissension. But is his alternative sufficient? Will the plies of this fantastically folded fabric never come undone? <coughs> Ought they never to come undone? These questions are especially pertinent to what Heidegger identifies as the place to which we have apparently been wandering all along, namely of Geschiedenheit. Here too we must be cautious, for what we might think of as the primary senses of this word will not be how Heidegger is going to understand them. Uh, Abgeschiedenheit in its current sense refers to seclusion or solitude, for example, that of a monastic life or a hermitage on a mountain. We can find a similar, though more metaphorical, use of the term in a recollection by Erwin Mahold, with which Heidegger was familiar, where Mahold speaks of his friend Trockel's Christian resignation and cloistral inner Abgeschiedenheit. The word also has the valence of having departed, not just from worldly concerns, but from the world as such. Thus, the Abgeschiedenen are the deceased. This sense can be heard in, another, uh, in the work of another friend of Trockel's, namely Karl Borromeus Heinrich, who composed two texts from the perspective of a departed one, both titled Briefe auf der Abgeschiedenheit, before attempting suicide himself. Uh, both of these texts appeared together with poems by Trockel in 1913 in the avant-garde journal Der Brenner, uh, which Heidegger reports on several occasions that, that he had been reading since 1912. So this is where he first encountered Trakl. Uh, these, these texts by Heinrich and Trakl's relationship to him eventually led to Trakl's poem, Gesang des Abgeschiedenen, which was published in Der Brenner the following year and dedicated to Heinrich. Um, and I'm going to note that Heidegger was himself quite familiar with this poem. Uh, he refers to it in his Trakl essay. He makes reference it, uh, to it in his Marginalia to Grodek. Um, and he also made some marginal marks in his, his copy of um, the volume containing this, on, this Abgeschiedenen. Uh, it seems to be here, he's suggesting that uh, this der should become des. Uh, so uh -huh. The lunar paths, um, not of the departed ones, but of the departed one. Um, also, I'd be curious to hear what you think about this. Uh, das from nun hingeht. Uh, is, is he thinking from there? Why, why does he mark the from? I'm, I'm not sure. I'd be curious to hear. 
Um, now, for Heidegger, there is admittedly a stroke of departure in Abgeschiedenheit. The soul must sever itself, sie scheiden, from the corrupt and corrupting Geschlecht. But the separation is not merely negative. The soul has both a guide and a destination. It can and must follow the stranger who has already departed elsewhere, who is, Heidegger says, the Abgeschiedene, the one who has cut himself off from lovers and mundane others, the one who, in losing himself, has not been destroyed, but has slid into the evening that alters sense and image. On Heidegger's reading, there is accordingly not only detachment from, but detachment toward. And that toward which the stranger and soul have and are becoming detached has a singular zin, which means not just sense, but also direction, in connection with the old High German zinan, quote, to journey, to strive after, to strike out on a path. Heidegger says that everything that Trappel sings is gathered together into a single song, namely that of the detached, departed one. Indeed, he says that it is detachment itself that is doing the gathering. Likewise, Heidegger will say in the third and final section of his essay that this entire complex of detachment, which is none other than the place of Trappel's Gedicht, is itself gathered by the Abendmonds. Abgeschiedenheit, therefore, has a singularly spatial, zin, sense direction on Heidegger's interpretation. It also, as we will see, has a singularly linguistic zin. I will discuss each of these in turn, leaving aside for this presentation its additionally singular temporality. Uh, so first, the space of detachment. In the final portion of his essay, Heidegger again returns to the third stanza of Herbseele, this time tying it to a line from Gesang des Abgeschiedenen, where Trockel sighs, uh, O oh, das Wohnen in der beselten Bäuer der Nachts, O oh, to dwell in the ensouled blueness of night. Heidegger claims that what grants dwelling is, quote, in our language, the land, das Land, end quote. And since, according to Herbseele, it is the evening, Abend, that alters sense and image, the entire place of Trockel's Gedicht, its Abgeschiedenheit, must be embedded in the Abendland, uh, the evening land or land of evening. Whence this appeal to the land? Readers of Gesang des Abgeschiedenen, as of Herbseele, might hear a reference to a possible homeland and God. The whole stanza of which Heidegger cites only one line reads, Und es leuchtet ein Lämpchen, das Gute in seinem Herzen, und der Frieden des Maus, denn geheiligt ist Brot und Wein von Gottes Händen, und er schaut aus nächtigen Augen stiller dich der Bruder an, das er hohe von dorniger Wanderschaft, o oh, das Wohnen in der beselten Bläue der Nacht. It is, at any rate, hard to see how Trockel's poem would amount to an allusion to Germany, the land in which one says Abend lands, or to any earthly place at all, for that matter. Heidegger is nevertheless insistent that Abgeschiedenheit must lead the soul to the land of evening, as he is insistent that there must be a path there too. There is also an exclusionary, even nationalistic, character to this land of evening. Not just anyone can follow the strangers going under, the transition into what Heidegger now calls the land of beginning, of ascent or dawn, is rather only possible for what he calls the elect, uh, for those who have been, quote, separated out, ausgeschieden, that is, gathered into a gathering that gathers more gently and more quietly beckons, end quote. Heidegger does admittedly speak of a transformation of the Menschengeschlecht, which suggests the whole human race. Um, the resurrected Eingeschlecht, of which Trockel sings in Abendländisches Lied, might therefore refer to humanity as a whole, and not just to the lovers that had appeared in the preceding line, which Heidegger ignores. But Heidegger also says Trockel would have celebrated the very deaths in Grodek that likely drove him to suicide, if that is indeed what Trockel is referring to in his uh, eponymous poem. In any case, whether or not the land is meant to be Germany on Heidegger's interpretation, it's sure not heaven, it's sure not Europe, and it's not at all clear that everyone will be given passports. Second, the language of detachment. If there is indeed a nationalist strand in Heidegger's appeal to the Abendlands, we should not be surprised to find that it has one official language, or maybe two, but the second would only be allowed in its ancient form. Heidegger is admittedly dialoguing with a German poet, and as Derrida notes, a certain irreducible tether to the German language cannot be denied in his essay, especially at its crucial moments. Heidegger's thought and our attempt to think after him is so bound up with language that we must not fail to heed its idiom and tongue. But to think after Heidegger means not just thinking according to Heidegger or in the wake of Heidegger. It means not just thinking in or with his German. It also means to think against Heidegger, against the unnecessary or unjustified restrictions he imposes on the language. As Derrida writes, quote, 
We will have to multiply the drafts of the attempt at translation, harass the German word, and analyze it according to several waves, touches, caresses, or blows. There are, in other words, not just nationalist themes or motifs in Heidegger's essay. Even the language itself, at least in its tendency, bears, moreover, a certain idiomatic, properly nationalist character. The idiom of Heidegger's dialogue with Trockel, more than, its, more than just its themes, fascinates Derrida. It makes Heidegger's essay of particular relevance to a seminar dealing with nationality and philosophical nationalism. Derrida therefore frequently interrogates the moments when Heidegger appeals to German, both old and modern, to words spoken in Utzersprache, in our language, in order to clarify seeming ambiguities between Trockel's poetic language and his Heidegger's interpretation of it. We are in turn compelled to ask about the idiom of language and the idiom of property, about the idios of Heidegger's reading. Whose language, we could ask? To whom does the possessive adjective refer? Who owns German? Anyone who speaks it? or only those who grew up speaking it, the native Germans. Would the Platt Deitch of the Mexican Mennonite count, then? Or must one be part of the homeland? Is it enough to have been born there? But what would its boundaries be? Who would draw them? Perhaps we could say it is enough just to read Heidegger in the original. But when I do so, is German mine? And what is the original? Is it the modern German that I presume to understand? Or is it the old German that still resounds for those with ears to hear, as Fichte would put it? Or we could ask for those with a good dictionary. Or is the original older yet, the Proto-Germanic or the Indo-Germanic that Heidegger seems to have no qualms invoking? But is that even German any longer? And why doesn't he say Indo-European like we do, and like Derrida does without noting the difference? These questions expose some of the difficulties surrounding what Derrida identifies as Heidegger's insistence on an absolute univocity of tongue. Quote, what Heidegger's text is signaling and opening up toward, what it is appealing to, cannot be separated from this German possibility. That is, not the possibility of Germany in general, but a possibility that is unthinkable without the destiny of something like the German language and German poeticity, uh, and of its relation, of its gespräch, with thought, if not with philosophy. End quote. Now, while it may be plausible to focus on German, to insist on it absolutely marks the height of linguistic hubris, and hubris, as we learn from the Greeks, must always fall. Uh, the collapse of such a regime need not be provoked from without, however, from a language foreign to the mother tongue. Rather, as we will see, Abgeschiedenheit, the very term under which Heidegger places Trakos Gedicht, undermines the center of power from within. Language, as Derrida reminds us, is never our own. Uh, so now section three, uh, Abgeschiedenheit in our middle high German. Um, to show this, I will turn to a tradition Heidegger disavows in his reading of Trockel, namely Christianity. Derrida, for his part, does not so much seek to ascertain whether and in what way Trockel's work is Christian as to problematize Heidegger's denial and preterition of it. Here I also am not so interested in answering one way or the other, although some of the material I quoted earlier does suggest that it would not be so easy to dam up the Christian current as Heidegger thinks. Rather, I would like to show how Abgeschiedenheit itself has a heritage, a predominantly Christian heritage, that stands in tension with the interpretation Heidegger gives to it. The word Abgeschiedenheit stems from the Middle High German Abgeschiedenheit, itself a combination of the verb Schaden or Geschaden, to cut, to separate, and the prefix Abba, away. The medieval Dominican theologian Meister Eckhart, with whom both Trockel and Heidegger were familiar, appears to have been the first to use the noun form in his late 13th century Councils on Discernment, where, incidentally, one finds the first appearance of Gelassenheit, or in Middle High German, Gelassenheit, uh, which Eckhart employs as a synonym of Abgeschadenheit. Uh, Heidegger, it should be noted, um, not only quotes from Eckhart's tractate on several occasions, but he also marked it up extensively in his personal copies of the Middle High German, which you see on the left and of a modern German translation. Heidegger also likes uh, different colors, and there might be a system. Uh, we could talk about that. There are green, red, yellow colors. We have uh, pencil, lead pencil, and then we have um, ink as well. So, so he marks up his text. All right, so Abgeschiedenheit would go on to become one of the most important words in Eckhart's corpus. As Eckhart himself explains, quote, when I preach, I am accustomed to speak about Abgeschiedenheit, and the fact that the human must become empty of himself and of all things, end quote. Here I will briefly discuss now uh, how the term relates to language, space and time, and teleology in Eckhart. The first thing to be noted is that Abigail 
does not have a linguistic nationalist precedence for Eckhart. He is the only medieval theologian of rank whose body of work survives substantially in both Latin and the vernacular, and one cannot readily separate out which language expresses which ideas, at least not when it comes to terms such as abasheden, which also appears in Latin under the guise of uh, abstrahere and separare. Uh, from an Eckhartian perspective, it would therefore be absurd to restrict Latinate terms in German to a pejorative function, as Heidegger himself frequently does. This is because for Eckhart, the language itself is not what is important, whether it be German or Latin. Rather, language is itself something from which we must detach ourselves. Second, in both Latin and German, Eckhart frequently exhorts his audience to detach themselves from space and time, from the here and now, so that they may recognize and live in accordance with the highest powers of their soul. These powers, for their part, are already, quote, detached, abageshaven, from time and place. They are where the human being is of God's geschlecht, uh, or geslechte in Middle High German. Um, so a lot of Heidegger's terms, you can find them exactly in Eckhart, geschlecht, uh, geschienheit, many of those guys. Um, and so Eckhart is thinking here of uh, Aristotelian nous, among other things, uh, which he translates as an abgeschiedener geist. But even this is insufficient, for the danger looms that we could still interpret the ein Geschlecht of God in a detached human being as located somewhere, at some point in time, as a gathering of two. Despite his love of paradox, Eckhart would not settle for such a reading. What Eckhart is after is not a gathering or unification. Rather, he is advocating an implicit, always operative oneness so abyssal that it is beyond any power of the soul to realize. Indeed, it is even beyond God to realize. For this oneness, which we can only appropriate if we have left behind all notions of power and multiplicity, including that of God um, as Father or Person of the Trinity, itself transcends the categories of the understanding. Finally, although Eckhart's exhortations to detachment initially suggest a complete retreat from the world, the implications of detachment ultimately suggest a complete return to the world. Quote, take away the now of time, and then you will have all time. Detach yourself, shite Baba, from being either this or that, or having either this or that, and you will be all things and have all things. And thus, if you are neither here nor there, then you are everywhere. End quote. At this point, we will be able to live anywhere in the world, seeing all things as divine, without needing a reason why. We will, in short, become like the rose of Silesius. On a warum. Die Rose ist on warum, sie blüht, weil sie blüht, sie ach nicht ihre selbst, fragt nicht, ob man sie sieht. Heidegger was quite familiar with this distich, as well as with its source in Eckhart's appeal to live without why. Heidegger even recognized without pursuing it that, quote, what is unsaid in Silesius' saying here, and everything depends on this, says that the human being in the most concealed ground of his essence only first truly is when in his own way he is like the rose without why, end quote. Moreover, although he does not indicate this in his Trockel essay, Heidegger was also aware of how this idea of a life without why connects to the German mystical tradition of detachment. So... Uh, uh, section 4, Heidegger's Early Acquaintance with Detachment. Perhaps the best example comes from what appears to be the conclusion of Heidegger's very first lecture course, uh, held in 1915-1916, <coughs> of which only unpublished notes survive. The theme of this conclusion is Abgeschiedenheit. In it, Heidegger speaks of the detached man's ignorance and indifference to his city and customs. He speaks with Nicholas of Cusa of opposites co coinciding. And he speaks of detachment from both self and worlds. He then alludes to the books of Matthew and Genesis. When detachment has been realized and philosophy has reached its summit, we return back to our origins. We become like little children, and the spirit, Geist, of God, uh, again comes to hover over the waters. Here Heidegger seems to intend not only a prerequisite detachment from the world and from ourselves, but also how our relationship to the world will change as a result of this. In true detachment, we are able to see and be in the world as but an unfolding of the contraries that are one in God. Things no longer appear as distinct and opposed, but as God. For our part, teleology is suspended, our knowing transforms into an unknowing, and like children, our relation to God becomes a relation of play. As Heidegger writes in 1916, quoting an author whom he believed to be Meister Eckhart, quote, The father thus conveys his word to the soul, and the soul again in the word conveys itself to the father. Let us nurture this eternal play in God, so help us God. End quote. One could adduce many other passages throughout Heidegger's corpus, including a few months before his death, a conversation he had with a priest about Eckhart's understanding of Abgeschiedenheit. 
But suffice it to say here that Heidegger was by no means unaware of the Eckhartian strain of detachments. Why then does he suppress it in his reading of Trockel? Uh, so, section five, and then I'll have the code of so getting to the end. Uh, deconstructing detachment. At the beginning of this paper, I asked whether the dichotomy Heidegger draws between a polysemy that gathers and, in, and an imprecision that scatters is exhaustive. In other words, if the center cannot hold, is it really the case that things fall apart, as Yeats put it? Uh, is mere anarchy loosed upon the world? Now, we may well be unable to conceive of archic dissemination, for dissemination, as Derrida writes, uh, quote, means anything but a move toward the center, end quote. But this does not necessarily mean that a decentered anarchic dissemination is pernicious or a product of carelessness, as Heidegger suggests. Rather, a detached life of wandering without reason or why, without gathering into a particular place, time, or tongue, may be the most proper, most joyful way to be, and it may require utmost cultivation and care. My concern here is not to determine whether this is so, but to point it out as a possibility suggested by the German word Abgeschiedenheit. Why are we justified in hearing Fremd as from, Leise as Galician, and Sinn as Sinan, but not Abgeschiedenheit as Abgeschiedenheit? <coughs> It is one thing to question whether the valence of a word has relevance. It is another to silence it. The thing called detachment cannot readily be contained either. Once we begin to detach ourselves, at what point should we stop? When we are no longer within the problematic domain of metaphysics, perhaps. But how can Heidegger be so sure that what the soul does not, on his reading, detach itself from is not itself metaphysical? As Derrida points out in Of Spirit, Heidegger used the term geistisch positively earlier on in his career, but in the Trockel essay, he relegates this word to metaphysics, where, quote, uh, this is Heidegger, put in terms of Plato and the Abendland, platonisch abendländisch gesprochen, end quote, there is a separation between the sensible and the supersensible realms. Here, too, there is a problem. Note that Heidegger uses the adjectival form of Abendland pejoratively. We would have expected <coughs> Heidegger to say europäisch or occidental. But why ought we to hear Abendland as metaphysical at the beginning of the essay, but as our hidden non-metaphysical destiny in the third and final section of it? If there is some secret power to the words themselves, why ought Geistisch and Abendland to be acceptable in one text or passage or time period, but unacceptable in another? Many years before Geschlecht III, Derrida interpreted the metaphysics of presence as, quote, the exigent, powerful, systematic, and irrepressible desire for a transcendental signified, end quote for a term that would stop the chain of signification, that would not itself be subject to dis dissemination. Such a desire seems to guide Heidegger's placement of detachment, despite or perhaps even because of his varied attempts to safeguard it against a metaphysical incursion. Heidegger's desire to cordon off detachment, to, to, turn it, to turn it into a site of gathering rather than a comportment of releasement, remains plagued by what he is trying to purge. His thinking of detachment does not completely escape metaphysics. But the word itself suggests other possibilities. Earlier, I quoted Derrida's claim from Geschlecht three that for Heidegger, there can be no rigorous thought or poetic writing of dissemination. Derrida, in contrast, as we heard yesterday, is constantly striving to think dissemination rigorously. However we, uh, however we are to understand this in Derrida, such thought, I would like to suggest, might require a rigorous practice of detachment. And this practice uh, might prevent us uh, from becoming fixated um, or overly attached to one particular meaning or aspect of a word or thing. Even if we cannot fully comprehend dissemination, in detaching ourselves, we may yet learn to love it. And so here, a coda, pour uh, l'amour de la In April 1960, Heidegger gave a short improvised speech at a banquet in celebration of Trockel's friend and patron, the editor of Der Brenner, Ludwig von Ficker. Although Heidegger had already prepared a text, he decided to change course after hearing Ficker himself speak a word of thanks. For Ficker's words, which, among other things, spoke of love, of the immortalized seer Georg Trockel, and of the insufficiency of the scientific worldview, had reminded Heidegger of a line, not from a Greek or a German poet, but from, of all authors, Antoine de saint exupéry uh, an icon and hero of France who had died fighting against the Germans in 1944. Heidegger even quotes the line uh, from Citadel in the original French before providing a translation. Uh, Fond l'amour des tours qui domine les sables, stifte die Liebe zu den Türmen, denn sie beherrschen die Wüste, or I guess, uh, establish the love of towers which uh, dominate the desert. And this might be interesting to bring in, in uh, 
connection to Detroit, the, the Babel, um, and the thinking of towers in general. Um, Heidegger goes, goes on to, to claim that today we live in an age of desolation where everything is subject to calculation and where language itself is becoming a mere instrument of information transfer. But the desert is not yet completely naked. Even if dilapidated, there are still towers whose bells toll, quote, the sound of silence, that saying in which poets and those who think attempt to speak, end quote. In order to hear such silence through the cacophony of contemporary life, we must, Heidegger says, love. But what is love? To whom will we turn for guidance? Heidegger responds, quote, probably the deepest interpretation of what love is comes from Augustine, when he says, amo volo utsis, I love, that is, I want what is loved to be what it is. Love is letting be, sein lassen, in a deeper sense, according to which it calls forth essence, end quote. The guiding figures, indeed the only figures who are named in Heidegger's speech, are thus a 20th century Frenchman from Lyon and an early medieval bishop for present-day Algeria. In contrast, Heidegger refers solely to German and ancient Greek authors in his two essays on Trakl. Moreover, other than the negative comment about detachment from loved ones others that I discussed above, Heidegger has nothing to say on the subject of love in either of his essays, and only once does he mention Zeinloss and letting be, although even there it is not a matter of letting be as such. Uh, in his personal copy of Trockel, there is, as mentioned, a marginal note on Galassenheit, a term which Heidegger himself ties to Zeinlassen and love on several occasions elsewhere, but Galassenheit, the word and perhaps also the thing, did not make its way into the Trockel essays. In his speech for Ficker, however, everything comes down to letting be. It is unlikely Heidegger would go so far as to say with Trockel that all human beings are worthy of love. <coughs> One would additionally have to interrogate what Heidegger means by essence in his claim that letting be calls it forth. But his appeals in French and Latin to love and let be at least suggest a different way of reading Trockel and the placement of his Gedicht. What would such a reading look like? What would happen if we started from Trockel's aforementioned letter to Ficker, where, like a voice crying out in the wilderness, um, Trockel uh, declaims, God, only a tiny spark of pure joy, and one would be rescued, love, and one would be redeemed. Or with Marhold's interpretation that Trockel's Losungswort, his password, his parole, for humankind was, quote, to purify and bear yourself up to God, end quote, and that Trockel's aims were, quote, to tell people what they no longer knew, that their soul is something foreign on earth, is something divine, worthy of the highest care, and to sing to them of their golden stillness, end quote. Would we remember, if not Trockel's love for all people and for the decaying Geschlecht, then at least Georg's for Gretel? Would we remember that the siblings spoke French growing up, that Rimbaud was as important a poet for Trockel as Hölderlin? Even sticking with Abgeschiedenheit as the proper place of the poetry, would we, would Heidegger, recall that Eckhart uses this term synonymously with Gelassenheit? That the Middle High German words Gelassenheit, Abgeschiedenheit, and their cognates are, paradoxically, ways in which we are enjoined to liberate ourselves from any and all attachment to place, to words, and even to these very ways themselves. That we only truly are when we live like Silesius' rose, without determination, destination, or a reason why, when everything becomes divine to us, when we see all human beings, indeed all things, as worthy of love. That love, in Derrida's words, means, quote, to respect the other, to pay attention to the other, not to destroy the otherness of the other. Thank you. I'd like to open the floor for questions, Naomi. Thank you so much for your paper. Um, I wonder if you might indulge me, as I know that you also have musical interests. Um, and I think it's becoming quite clear from yesterday and today that this question of finding uh, a kind of rigorous dissemination that avoids the cellar of um, gathering and philosophical nationalism and the cryptus on the other hand of a bad dissemination is very important. I wonder if we might frame this specifically through the question of tone or or clang. And what I'm you can allow me one remark before I come to the question, which is that I'm thinking of what happens if this thinking of dissemination becomes so rigorous. What then happens to the clang? And I'm thinking here specifically of Gla, when Derrida is reading Hegel and thinking of the bell ringing, and he's thinking of these um, things that are resounding that are brittle, schröder. What happens when something becomes so rigorous and so rigid, perhaps, that its clang 
uh, changes and it's no longer this relationship between a fundamental tone and a series of harmonics above it that can be unified. And I wondered whether you might be able to imagine, sorry, I'm putting you on the spot, but imagine that this third way that you're speaking of a, of a gathered detachment, what that might then actually sound like to kind of echo your oral references in, in your coda. Yeah, so I, I think we would need to liberate ourselves from a dependence on the tonic. And, when, and, and not even think of modulation as re in reference to a tonic. But I, I think we would have to have something like atonal music, where we, there might be some patterns that are still remains, but we don't hear the next note necessarily in relation to where we began. Um, so, so that's how I would want to hear it. And we would accept that movement, right? And it's very hard to do musically. Um, we've been so habituated into the Western tonality that, that it takes a lot of effort and care, I would say, maybe a kind of love in order to be able to hear atonal music, um, or even things like quarter tones, right? So I, I would say that it would, look, it would sound something like that um, and the, the task would be to let it let it be and let it let it come and yeah. celebrate it. I like that a lot, and you know, a lot of people hear atonal music has been quite monotonous, mm -hmm. which makes me think, as we heard yesterday, of the monotony in la dissemination. Mm -hmm. So it's like this play of is atonality like something? What's that relationship then to the monotony potentially of this image? Thanks, Ian. I I found your talk very compelling and very convincing. Um, I want to draw. Uh, I want to draw, you know, your your attention to a place in the postscript to what is metaphysics, where I think in a very strong way Heidegger relates Abgeschiedenheit to sacrifice, and there it becomes very clear that he is calling us to um, sacrifice our relation to beings so that we can solely think and even relate back to beings from out of being as such. Um, and this, what you call here, love of Abgeschiedenheit, uh, I think just describes Heidegger's maybe, Heidegger's project from beginning to end. Um, and I would even agree with you that this is not meant to um, simply leave beings behind, but in precisely come to them so as to really love them, so as to let them be. Yeah. Um, and I think it was very convincing to point out how Abgeschiedenheit and Gelassenheit are going hand in hand. Mm -hmm. But then if I may push back a, a bit and think what Dehida has to say about sacrifice. <coughs> For example, when I think in a, in a, in a text he evokes the, the phoenix and he says, above all, I don't want, and I don't want anything to do with the phoenix because that will bring us to the logic of sacrifice that he hated. Uh, so he did not love anything from, of, of that sort, and he was trying to negotiate a way out of this logic of sacrifice that I think seems to be haunting uh, Heidegger's thinking of Abgeschiedenheit and even Gelassenheit. So to let the other be seems to presuppose the sacrifice that I, I have already abandoned the other for the sake of... of, of uh, of being, so, I mean, it's 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 a it's it, it's a remark. I I would ask you to to do more of this and and maybe try to convince me even more now that this is not sacrifice all the way down. Yeah, I think you're pointing to an important moment or danger in, in Heidegger's thinking, and I think maybe even in Eckhart's thinking. When I say all things become divine to me, I can see all things as God. Am I really? heeding the otherness of the other, or am I sort of taking it up into this perspective from which I've taken my, my comportment, something like that. So I think the sacrifice is important in as much as we are sacrificing ourselves from modes of discourse, from a tradition that would prevent that. But then, then I think there's a danger that we then are not actually relating to the other, we're relating to something like the universal. Uh, so, so I think I think there's work to be done, but I, I do think this goes back toward the world, um, which we see in Eckhart and which we see in Heidegger when he says something like, uh, "Letting be might be the hardest thing you can do, and require the most cultivation and the most work." I think he says that in the Origin of the Work of Art. Um, I, I think this this move is trying to to break from a tradition uh, without leaving behind 
so that we can then return back and try to develop a proper comportment in relation to this inquiry. <coughs> Yeah. Um, let's see. I have a <clears throat> me, comment and a question. Comment is just a follow-up to Naomi's question. It strikes me also that uh, Dorno's essay on parataxis, or critiques Heidegger's readings of Holden, is very similarly structured to Adorno's writings on Schoenberg, where parataxis is a model of rigorous non-subordination, so that where, where there is no tone. Right. Um, yeah. And that gets us back to this question of syntax versus semantics from yesterday, and privileging the syntactical versus the lexical, in a certain <coughs> sense, sheltering a uh, night from the syntactical relational place. That's just a comment. <coughs> I had just a hypothesis that keeps coming back to me, and I don't know what to do with it, and, which is that the language of Untergang und Abendmann und relatively continuous, circular, organic, so to speak. And then the language of Lichtung is discontinuous, language of uh, leap. And it seems to me this play between continuous and discontinuous Lichtung and Untergang is relatively close to this placement and detachment problem you're talking about. And then it even occurred to me, I think, allowing me a little bit of a philological extravagance, that when Derrida tries to describe what Heidegger is doing, as a transition metonymic, if we translate that back into German, we get metonymischer Übergang, and we, so we go back from the um, leap to the continuous Übergang uh, there. And one of the questions of Übergang is you know, the transition seems to imply graduality, at least in, in German, when it's uh, Übergang. Right. So I just, I, I just wanted to kind of throw that to you maybe a little unfairly, but. Uh, <coughs> I think it's an, uh, an interesting suggestion. I, I wonder if we could read Heidegger's text as, as maybe performing this this tension that you're yeah. that you're pointing <coughs> out, <and> exposing <coughs> the necessity of something like uh, rupture, leap, some kind of parataxis. Um, I guess I, I guess I, I, I'd like I'd like to pursue that. I think I think one one could do that with the with the very mode of Heidegger's sort of. Uh, discourse. And I think Derrida is, is doing that on, on some level, especially in the introduction to Shemesh 3. Melissa? I mean, yeah. 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 Um, thank you for that. That was beautiful uh, and really rich. But I kind of want to clang in a different direction, okay. which is I noticed that you marked the poet as she. I thought you said the poet she. I did, yes. And that was. Um, <coughs> So that kind of was interesting for me um, because it's inconceivable in this whole field, discursive field, that the poet could be she. And I kind of want to press like on the other way you're going. So you're going with Heidegger through this philological move. But the literary critics that I looked at on Tackel, you know, Tackel, you talked about nationalism. Tackel is, of course, Austrian, not German. And in, um, in the poem uh, Herbseele, I myself was obsessed with the stanza before Heidegger quotes Herbseele. Um, and I, my German is so awful um, <coughs> that um, I, well, I might have to try it. But the last line is, Nur der Bach rinnt still und stadt. And the word stadt, as Stillmark tells us, is an Austrian word and only an Austrian word for silence. So I kind of got obsessed with the different sounds of silence, that, like um, whether or not silence is always toning, or what speaks, what doesn't speak, what word does one give for silence. And the, the place where Heidegger walks in is exactly after the Austrian tone. So a regional one. Now you can imagine, it's very easy to imagine like, getting rid of how Heidegger explains this. But this opens up another thing which, like, I can't help it, but coming from the outside, there's this elephant in the room for me, like, of the whole story that we've been talking here. <laughs> and that elephant in the room has to do with the relationship between sexual difference, sexuality, and love. So you told a great love story here, but I want to know how we get from corrupted Geschlecht over here to this love over here without a thinking of 
of a relationship between sexuality, and I'm thinking of it in a more Freudian way, so drive or something without an object or even something that pushes that soul on its path. And there's one point in Geshlesh 3 where Derrida sort of says, I would almost want to say the word desire, but I'm not going to use that word. But there is something of a drive that is moving here. And that there's something to me so, um, and, and that word Geschlecht, uh, and this is what the literary critics will tell you, that Trockel himself got it from Weiniger. That that word is so overladen with a cultural Austrian heritage of a kind of Nazism, of a Jewish self-hatred, of a mark about the mark, about a thinking of what the relationship of sexual difference is. And if you read the literary critics, they'll say it's clear that Weiniger uh, influenced Wittgenstein and Trockel, and that that word, when Trockel is using it, is is you can't not hear Weiniger. So I'm kind of interested, you're talking about what Heidegger is not hearing in Eckhart, and I want to say, what does Heidegger have to do not to hear Weiniger, and not to hear the Stadt, and not to, and you know, and how does that then inflect everything that we've been talking about of homeland or nationalism, and, and, and actually about sexual difference in the story. I see a lot of great points there. I might just add to uh, your confusion and my confusion. Um, Entartete Geschlecht uh, is a line from Wagner's Tristan and Isolde. When Isolde, uh, at the very very beginning of scene one, Isolde sings of the, the corrupt sort of race you know, referring to Tristan. Um, and so there's that resonance. Um, and Heidegger actually quote, Entartete Geschlecht appears in Heidegger's essay. I don't think that word appears in Trockel. Um, but there's also this Wagnerian current, which we would have to uh, think about as well, especially with its complicity uh, with National Socialism. Um, <coughs> the second thing I would say with respect to uh, stillness, um, this Geloit der Stille that Heidegger likes to invoke, and Derrida also uh, makes notes about that, but not deeper makes marks on this in, in Heidegger's essay. Um, I think he wants to let that silence be heard, but it's also it's a particular kind of silence of stillness, right? Uh, Derrida nicely says uh, it's uh, one one is silent in German, right? So Schweigen in a translative sense um, to to silence something. Um, so so that that's also a problem. So I'm kind of agreeing with you that these are these are uh, difficulties. Um, I I think I, I made the the reference to. Uh, the poet, as, as her, when I said uh, she condenses uh, everything or precipitates her song, um, because I think for, for Eckhart, um, who was very um, influenced by um, medieval female mystics, uh, Marguerite mm -hmm. Corrette, for instance, um, I, I don't think he sees that distinction. I, I, he's, I think he's, he's trying to move, move beyond a kind of re reductive Mm -hmm. Sexual difference. I don't. I don't know about a, a more sort of fecund uh, or sort of richer way to think se sexual difference. Someone like Eckhart, um, from the and that's kind of the perspective I'm taking. Um, but but I, I think the move would, would be to try to. Uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't want to say o overcome sexual difference or something like that. But see the other as as other than me and love the other for their otherness. Um, which would require cultivation. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to trying to think about this. Um, I think it's a very interesting question. Sorry, Dr. Mary. Thank you. Um, second. <coughs> yeah, just just a, just a short <laughs> comment. Actually, in connection to what you said, uh, this <coughs> ammo photo with this yeah. pseudo Augustine, because as such, not located in a way. I think. And I think. Uh, Augustine would probably say Dilly J. Yeah. Probably not so the thing is, what I uh, I would uh, like to say to that is maybe it refers to the sexual difference problem. Um, in Augustine, it's that uh, as as far as I know, this this is what God says to the human being. Amo uh, volo it puts this. So that's uh, it, it refers to to the creation of of, of the human being. Uh, so that's a very very powerful <coughs> love. Huh? That's a that's just actually not a human love. And um, 
Heidegger is using, of course, this phrase in his love letters to Anna Arendt right. at the beginning. Yes. Um, and this shows also, of course, like how Heidegger works with a typical Christian, <laughs> a super Christian topic. Uh, first, of course, also to Derrida, <coughs> always asking why Heidegger is so blind for the Christian motives in in uh, in, in, in Trachel. But but he is not interested in this in this in this quest, Christian dimension of this phrase of Saint Augustine. He used it even to seduce. Uh, <laughs> His student, um, and it worked. Uh, but at the same time, you see how he is immune. He, what kind of immunity he gets from that? You know, if I say I, I let you, I let you. I, I bring, I, I even bring you to your essence mm -hmm. by mm, right. sexual behavior. Uh, I see I see a little bit of a problem here yeah, in, in this sense. So it's it's not so pure as it seems to be. Right. And uh, <coughs> uh, yeah, well, I, I thought that you are purifying it a little bit. Well, so That's what so I was getting at yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so that I mean, really, I, I was trying to point out that within Heidegger's own thinking, when he's when he's uh, compelled or inspired to improvise, right? He talks about love. Um, and, and so, and so, I, and I did question the idea of bringing something into its essence. That sounds quite, quite problematic. So I don't, I don't deny that. What, what I was trying to do is to suggest that there is an alternative within Heidegger's own discourse. Right? I'm not, I'm not necessarily affirming that discourse, but it's, it suggests a possibility that's <coughs> hardly compatible with the Trockel essay. Um, and just regarding Augustine, uh, we, we also might want to think about Caritas. And agape, right, and some, some kind of sacrificial love that might be an interesting way to go. Uh, Augustine, one, one of his moves against Neoplatonism uh, was to say that someone like his mother could have uh, mystical ascent, right, and they could have it together, right, and so that it wasn't, I mean, there are, there are all sorts of problems concerning women in the church, but, but Augustine at least wanted that possibility for his mother, right, it wasn't an intellectual ascent. It was any, any, something any, any Christian could do. So I think there's a possibility there um, that allows for um, love, allows for uh, anyone to have this type of insight. Okay. So I, I don't know, I, I, might, I might look at his relationship with mother, his mother and think about their love, think about Caritas. But I, I, see, I see the problem. The mother of truck. The mother of uh, August. Oh, that's yes, uh, Monica. 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 Yeah, okay. but okay. Yeah, she's the big. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there's still much to discuss. I know there is, um, but. <coughs>